On an October evening in 1997, a Loomis Fargo employee was tired of waiting for the good life. He put in motion his own get-rich-quick scheme, disappearing with over $17 million in Loomis cash. The robbery sparked an international manhunt as the FBI struggled to recover the money and bring the thief and his gang to justice. At 7.15 a.m. on Sunday morning, October 5th, 1997, the Charlotte Mecklenburg, North Carolina police received a call from a woman named Tammy Gant. She told police her husband David hadn't returned home from his job at the Loomis Fargo warehouse the night before. And she was concerned. The Charlotte Police Department dispatched an officer to investigate. Upon arriving at Loomis Fargo, the patrolman surveyed the scene. David Gant's pickup truck was parked outside the warehouse gate. The chain link fence was open. So was the warehouse door. Something appeared to be terribly wrong. The officer contacted dispatch. The Charlotte police notified Loomis Fargo, and a supervisor arrived to try and sort out what had happened. David Gant was nowhere to be found. The vault was locked, but all the keys were missing, along with a company van. There were no signs of forced entry. The supervisor told police that Gant worked the night before and was scheduled to close up the vault along with a trainee. He took the police officer to the security center. There he found the videotapes from two of the security camera's VCRs had been taken. In a second cabinet, he found a VCR with its tape still recording. There on this tape was vault supervisor David Gant emptying the vault. I can't believe it. David Gant. Loomis had been robbed. Because the money stolen from Loomis Fargo belonged to federally insured banks, the crime was a federal offense. The FBI was called in. At the time the agents arrived, they knew only that vault supervisor David Gant, a Loomis Fargo armored van, and an unknown amount of money from the vault were all missing. Crime scene technicians processed the facility. It was a puzzling crime scene, according to Charlotte FBI agent Mark Rossi. What you notice is a lack of anything noticeable. It's not a crime scene in which there are bodies and blood and things strewn all about. It's just a big, empty-looking warehouse. You don't know how much money is missing to get in the vault. And then you sort of gather your thoughts and gather the agents and say, what do we know and where do we go from here? Because all the keys were missing, Loomis officials were locked out of their own vault. To learn what happened, they would have to break in. Well, obviously, your concern immediately is with the missing body, with David Gant. Was he abducted? Was he harmed? Was he forced to do something against his will? Is he still on the premise? Is he locked inside the vault? 
But David Gant wasn't in the vault. In fact, nothing was in the vault. Gant had taken everything. FBI agent John Wydra. You're talking about uh, 2,800 pounds in currency, uh, mostly $20 bills. Uh, they used the 20s to uh, stack the uh, ATM machines. So most of it was in $20 bills. Almost $11 million in $20 bills was missing. It was a total of $17 million, uh, $17.3 million that turned up missing. Six, four, seven, this money would be impossible to trace. None of the cash was marked. It had come from general circulation, and the serial numbers on the bills were non-sequential. With nothing to look at and no clues inside the warehouse, the investigators hoped the robbers left some clue outside. The agent started by looking at David Gant's truck. They found something interesting in the ashtray. A wedding ring. When we found David's wedding band in his truck, the question arose, is David sending us a signal? Is he trying to tell us that he has cut ties with his loved ones, that he's moving on, that he's starting a new life? The next day at the Charlotte offices of the FBI, agents began to piece together what little they knew about the crime. After a weekend of investigating, all they learned was that David Gant, a van, and a little over $17 million in untraceable bills disappeared during or after Gant's work shift the day before. It was not a great way to start an investigation. With a 24-hour head start, David Gant could be anywhere by now. If the FBI ever hoped to find the missing cash, they needed to find Gant fast. Agents started by talking with his wife, Tammy, and one of David's sisters. They hoped some detail of his personal life would give them some idea why he pulled the heist, who might have helped him, and most importantly, where he was. David's wife, Tammy, gave the FBI a lot of background information on her husband. She told them she hadn't noticed anything odd about David's behavior before the robbery. She explained that money was tight and the couple lived simply, but had run up some credit card debt. Tammy told the agent she kept a close eye on the bottom line and kept David on a strict budget. David had been working a lot of long hours to try and get ahead of their bills. Tammy couldn't believe he was involved in this and was certain someone must have forced him to do it. She feared he had been kidnapped, or maybe worse. You go through David Scott Gant's routine, and what you find out is there is no noticeable blip on the screen. He was acting the way that you would expect any normal person who should have returned home the following day to act. He went out to dinner with his wife. He helped put the groceries away. He had made his dental appointment. He had been living life just as he had lived it every other day prior to this crime. So there was nothing immediate that jumped out that said, here's the indicator. This is going to tell us why he did it, who he did it with, and where he's gone to. It just wasn't there. To find David Gant, the authorities needed to circulate his photograph and register him with the National Crime Information Center computer system. But to do that, they needed to indict him. United States Attorney Mark Calloway prosecuted the case. Because they had David Gant on tape taking the money out of Loomis, we had a grand jury that happened to be sitting on Monday, and we were able to indict him for the larceny the next day. So uh, two days, less than 48 hours after the theft, uh, David Gant was indicted for it. 
On the Monday following the theft, the media learned of the story. The FBI launched a nationwide manhunt as part of the investigation they were now calling Operation Charlotte. The Bureau now had a catchy name for the investigation, but they still had no idea where David Gant and the missing $17 million had gone. Agents secured the airports and bus stations. They circulated photos of David Gant and asked anyone who saw him to contact the authorities immediately. Because David Gant had taken over a ton of cash, the FBI knew he would need a considerable amount of space to transport and store all the money. They checked the rental car and truck agencies in town to see if anyone fitting Gant's description might have rented a truck. They came up empty. To the agents in the Charlotte office of the FBI, this investigation began to seem very familiar. In 1997, in Jacksonville, Florida, another Loomis Fargo employee emptied a vault of over $18 million in cash. Special agent in charge William Perry worked the previous investigation. There was an earlier uh, uh, theft from a, uh, a facility in Jacksonville that the uh, Charlotte Division of the FBI had been involved in. As a matter of fact, recovered the money up in the Asheville area. Uh, so we were, we were very concerned about the fact that something similar had happened and it would be important for us to find out the location quickly of where the money had been transported to and uh, where the van was. In that particular case in Jacksonville, it had, they had used a storage facility, so it was an idea, too, that we would be looking for a storage facility similar to that. In the Jacksonville, Florida heist, the thief stashed the money in North Carolina. Thinking Gant may have copied his fellow employee, FBI agents checked public storage facilities. They found nothing. The FBI hit a dead end. It appeared David Gant had simply vanished and taken a ton of cash with him. The FBI looked back to try and uncover any suspicious activity in and out of the city on the weekend of the heist. This was difficult because Charlotte hosted the Coca-Cola 600 NASCAR race at the Charlotte Motor Speedway on the weekend the heist occurred. Well, now all of a sudden, you've got hundreds of thousands of out-of-town people, not all of whom use their actual identification when they're renting cars or staying at hotels. And you have to go through this list and decide who's legitimate and has a reason to be there and who might be David Scott Gant's alias or one of his partners. David Gant's accomplices, if there were any, could have been any one of the thousands of people who choked the interstates in and around Charlotte on race weekend. When not thinking of David Gant as a perpetrator, the FBI feared for his safety. You've got a missing body, and with any missing body, you've got to weigh up the possibility that this person's either in danger or may have been killed. And then again, feeling that more likely than not, he would have had accomplices to move that amount of money. Then the question is, he's a known. The accomplices are an unknown. What's to stop them from knocking him off? The FBI knew they had to find David Gant before his accomplices did. But they didn't even know where to look. Late Monday afternoon, two days after Gant disappeared, authorities finally got a break. A man cutting grass discovered the unmarked Loomis van. It was in the woods, less than 10 miles from the Loomis warehouse. The van was locked. Loomis still hadn't found the stolen keys, so the FBI had to tow it to their processing center and wait for a locksmith to break it open. Inside, they were shocked to find the van held a considerable amount of cash. 
agents counted the small denomination bills Gant had left behind. It totaled a not insignificant $3.3 million. Also in the van were the two missing surveillance tapes from the Loomis security office, Gant's Loomis-issued pistol, and both sets of vault keys. The FBI could only guess as to why over $3 million had been abandoned. Perhaps the thieves got scared, or maybe they ran out of time or physical space to put the money, or the energy to move it. As for the videotapes, the FBI tried to read the evidence. You find the videotapes in the van, you say to yourself, OK, we left one behind at the Loomis facility, and that could have been a mistake, but this obviously was not a mistake. So who's trying to tell us what? Is David Gant telling us, here's the videotapes, I did it, good luck trying to catch me? Or is it his partner saying, David Gant did it, you need to go find him to steer us away from whoever these unknown partners were? The FBI had indeed found the missing van and some of the missing Loomis money, but they were no closer to finding David Gant or his suspected accomplices and $14 million was still out there somewhere. Charlotte, North Carolina is one of the East Coast's fastest growing centers of banking. On any given day, hundreds of millions of dollars pass through the Charlotte area. In October of 1997, Loomis Fargo employee David Gant took some of those millions for himself he walked out of the Charlotte Loomis Fargo office with $17 million and disappeared. The FBI suspected that Gant hadn't acted alone, but they couldn't be sure. Gant simply vanished, and his accomplices, if he had any, were completely unknown. The FBI hoped that some clue of his whereabouts would surface as they looked into his background. The Charlotte agents compiled lists of Loomis employees to be interviewed, past and present. Yeah, this one this guy, Jim, uh, he's a new employee. They started by talking with Gant's supervisor and the trainee who worked with him the night of the heist. The trainee told them David sent him home at the end of his shift and locked up the vault himself. Gant's supervisor told the FBI Gant worked at Loomis for several years and was an average employee. He'd been working a lot of overtime and had recently been promoted to vault supervisor. It was a job he didn't perform very well. David left some cash unattended and had been reprimanded severely. He was nearly fired. In an effort to learn if Gant had any accomplices, the FBI broadened their search and interviewed anyone who had come in contact with David Gant before the heist. Special agent in charge, William Perry. We weren't really looking for what type of person had done the heist because we knew the person that did the heist. It was Mr. Gant. Uh, who his accomplices were was the, was the challenge for us. Uh, typically, in something like that, it's a matter of elimination of people that we can, that we can identify that know him from his past, uh, that were fellow employees, uh, uh, friends, social acquaintances, uh, relatives, or otherwise. The FBI spoke with over a hundred people in two days, looking for anything that might lead them to Gant's accomplices or give them some clue as to why he pulled this heist. Agent Dick Womble kept in touch with Gant's family, thinking he might contact them. Uh, they have not heard from him. They're still leaning toward the theory that uh, David was forced to do this. The picture we were getting from the family uh, does not seem to fit the profile of somebody that's going to 
take $17 million by himself and have a plan of action and a uh, destination to go to. While his family still thought it was impossible that David Gant could have orchestrated a plan to steal $17 million, Agent John Widra began looking into Gant's background. This is a man who'd never been in trouble with the law, uh, was honorably discharged from the military, um, worked overtime on a regular basis from all outward appearances, uh, would not be a willing participant in this type of crime. Yet we had video uh, from several different security cameras showing him spending over an hour loading this van. So, you know, our first thoughts were, was he put up to it? You know, was somebody out there? Was, what was his motivations for doing this? All right, gentlemen, we have a time frame here for two days. Agents started to track David Gant's activities leading up to the heist. They made a timeline of every minute of every day, hoping that when the chalk dust cleared, they would uncover the name of an accomplice or some lead. But they came up empty. The FBI started digging deeper into David Gant's past. They talked with his old army buddies. No one offered any real leads. After hundreds of interviews, the FBI was left with conflicting information about David Gant. What we uncovered about David Scott Gant is that he had two very different personas, two very different lifestyles. On one hand, he would be described as a hard worker, a conscientious worker, proud of his job. On the other hand, he would be described as a disgruntled worker who felt that he was better than the job and that he was ready to move on. In his personal life, on one hand, we had a description of a very church-going family man. On the other hand, we heard of a person who wasn't happy with the fact that the purse strings were controlled by his wife, that he was not allowed to smoke within his own house, and that there were some things that were building inside of him, both personally and professionally, as far as the pressure uh, goes, and that he was ready to bust. Mostly, Gant's friends were shocked he pulled it off. It seemed no one, from his old army buddies to his wife, gave him enough credit to have planned and executed such a big heist. Still, the FBI did have him on tape emptying the vault. Many of the people who knew David Gant characterized him as a loner. Some did mention that the one person he seemed close to was a fellow worker named Kelly Campbell. Kelly worked with David at Loomis for several years, but she quit about a year before the heist. While at Loomis, her fellow employees reported the two of them spent a lot of time together. The FBI also learned they met occasionally after work. Agents paid a visit to Kelly Campbell. She told them she didn't know anything about the heist and denied she was ever close to David Gant. The interesting thing with Kelly Campbell is that you had these external people saying that they were close, that they were good friends, that they would have lunch together, and that even after she had left Loomis Fargo, they stayed in contact. But that's not what Kelly Campbell told us she painted a different picture that they weren't all that particularly close and that they really hadn't maintained much of any contact since she had left. We had an obvious discrepancy here and we had some doubts about the truthfulness of Kelly Campbell. Despite their doubts about Kelly Campbell, the FBI had no information they could act on. The agents turned their attention to Gant's phone records, hoping they might offer a concrete lead. They found that several phone calls had been made the night of the heist from inside Loomis to David Gant's cell phone. Since Gant was seen inside taking the money, he was calling someone on the outside to whom he loaned his cell phone. 
Gant's pager records showed he received a series of numeric pages from his cell phone on the night of the heist. Three digits were repeatedly entered into his pager. One, four, three. Agents had no idea what it meant, but it seemed to confirm that Gant did not act alone. The agents surmised that whoever was on the other end of those phone calls must have been involved. On a Saturday evening, exactly one week after the robbery, a room full of FBI agents gathered. They were prepared to receive numerous hot tips after Gant's picture aired on America's Most Wanted. We were counting on that show to spread beyond our immediate viewing area in case the partners or Gant were in another part of the country. Due to extended coverage of tonight's baseball game, America's Most Wanted will not be seen on the East Coast. And what had happened was, in the initial airing of the show, it got preempted by a baseball playoff game. So we were all on standby waiting for this massive influx of telephone information that was going to set us in the right direction, and it just did not come. After one week, $14 million was unaccounted for, and the FBI had few leads. They had no idea where David Gant had gone. And as time went by, the less likely it seemed they would ever find him or the money. As time went on, the Charlotte FBI continued to keep the Loomis Fargo heist in the news. On the radio this morning with Schaefer and the Eggman at Oldies Radio, Magic 96.1 here in Charlotte. Uh, more news coming out. They found that van, huh? How about that? They got the van. Now they're looking for the driver, and Loomis Fargo has posted a reward. Right, Liz? A couple of days ago, the stolen Loomis van that was used in the robbery was found abandoned. David Gant is still on the run. He still eludes police. Loomis Fargo offered a $500,000 reward for any information. The leads began to pour into the FBI offices. Agents set up a special database for storing and sorting the growing number of tips. Anyone who suspected anyone of having money or spending money that they shouldn't have contacted us. And then we would have to go back out and check on all these calls. Calls came into the FBI offices day and night. This is the FBI Charlotte Field Office. At the sound of the tone, leave a message. Uh, hello? Yeah, um, I know this guy, Eric Payne, and you might want to check him out. He's been spending a lot of cash lately. He's been having these really big problems. Yeah, that's the right. The FBI got I the got first Just tip the they could use. What's the address? An informant yeah. reported that shortly after the heist, a man named Eric Payne was spending a lot of money. At first, the FBI thought Payne might be an alias for Gant. They couldn't find a connection to Gant, but did learn he paid off a credit card, bought a Harley, a Chevy Tahoe, and first-class airline tickets, and took an expensive vacation. This was a tip that seemed worth checking out. When it came in, Eric Payne was on vacation. The FBI paid a visit to his workplace and interviewed his co-workers. Payne's co-workers confirmed his lavish spending. The FBI learned he had been enjoying the high life lately and partying a lot. He even bought breast enlargements for his two sisters. His wife not only got new breasts, she also got a new nose. Payne told everyone he'd inherited the cash. The key information surrounding Eric Payne was that he worked at Reynolds and Reynolds Graphics Company which was interestingly just across the street from where the Loomis van was found. Typically what you find with crimes are that people go to where they're comfortable. So when you find the van being recovered, 
and you find the name Eric Payne, you say to yourself, again, is this coincidental that you've got someone who's spending money, whose alibi is somewhat shaky, and yet we've also got this van found in an open field behind the workplace. The FBI followed up on Eric's purchases and found he financed the Chevy Tahoe, but made his down payment in 20s. Not wanting to alert him of their suspicions, the FBI decided to wait until he returned from his vacation to speak with him. As the Charlotte FBI was gathering leads, some suspicious activity was also going on in nearby Gaston County, just a few miles from Charlotte. The Gaston County police were working on a narcotics investigation when a reliable informant told them a man had just purchased a $600,000 home and paid cash. Sergeant Rome of the Gaston County Police identified the man as Steve Chambers and began an extensive background check on Steve and his wife, Michelle. Sergeant Rome learned Steve Chambers was making purchases all over town. In the last few weeks, he had paid cash for a truck and a BMW Roadster. So when you start putting them all together, a large number of cash purchases, large cash transactions and everything, uh, there's got to be a source of the funds. And based on the information that I was able to obtain on the Chamber's finances and everything, uh, two and two didn't add up. Tell me about it. To the Gaston County Police, it seemed highly probable this was illegal drug money rather than Luma's cash. Still, the police started keeping a close eye on the chambers. In the weeks following the heist, information about the chambers' irregular spending habits started pouring in. The local investigation into the chamber's activities had begun to require more attention than most of Sergeant Rome's ongoing cases for the Gaston County Police. It was real foolish on their part on the way they actually went about spreading the cash around and flaunting the cash because within just a short period, eight different informants contacted me about their involvement as far as transactions that they had tried to uh, accomplished or actual had carried out. The home Steve and Michelle Chambers bought was in the small town of Cramerton, just a 15-minute drive from downtown Charlotte. With a little over 2,500 residents, this bedroom community covers three square miles. The town is in the Guinness Book of World Records for the shortest Main Street, which is only 75 feet long. The town also is home to an exclusive gated community called Kramer Mountain. As soon as the chambers moved in, the police in Cramerton started to get some strange information about their newest residents. Chief David Young heads the nine-man Cramerton police force. The comments were, these people were living in a manufactured home six weeks ago uh, and now they ha they have all this uh, newfound wealth and apparently neither of them had really had a steady job in two years so they they go from unemployed living in a mobile home to having more money than they can spend The Chambers moved into their exclusive home a few weeks after the Loomis Fargo heist. Steve's wife, Michelle, told anyone who would listen that her husband was a retired pro football player who scored big while gambling in Atlantic City. She also added that he was selling some laundromats in Texas. None of this made much sense, but people were willing to listen and accept the Chambers' money. Michelle paid for everything with packets of cash, mostly 20s. What is that? 
One person to whom the Chamber's stories didn't ring true was Cramerton's mayor, Kathy Biles, who lived a few doors down from their new home. Everyone was under the impression that he was a retired Dallas Cowboys football player, though none of the men in our neighborhood had ever heard of his name. Um, and they just stayed to themselves. They were very different than the other folks in the neighborhood. Mayor Biles wasn't the only one who thought the Chamber's stories were a bit suspicious. Cramerton Police Chief David Young decided to call Mark Rossi at the Charlotte FBI. Rossi told Chief Young the FBI was beginning to suspect the Chambers in the Loomis heist. Chief Young's tip was one of hundreds that were flooding the FBI. The agents had to sort through hundreds of tips and determine which were important and which were not. Steve Chambers clearly was beginning to generate a lot of heat. The FBI focused much of their attention on him. Far from being an ex-professional football player, Steve Chambers was a small-time crook, a bookie, fence, and sometimes drug dealer who claimed to have mafia ties. He had been arrested for passing bad checks. A report came back to the police that Chambers had caused a disturbance at a local bar and been thrown out. Furious, he offered to buy the club for $400,000 in cash. Chambers' conspicuous spending was certainly raising suspicions. But the FBI had no way of proving he was spending Loomis money. It had been several weeks since David Gant loaded $17 million in unmarked bills into a company van and drove out of a Charlotte Loomis Fargo warehouse and vanished. The FBI was searching for David Gant and his accomplices by monitoring the hundreds of reports of suspicious spending in and around Charlotte. Agents were also checking bank records to try and track any suspicious cash transactions. This was a time-consuming task, according to FBI agent John Wydra. In terms of cash transaction reports, those get filed by businesses immediately, but it goes up to Washington and then it's funneled back down to us, along with everybody else's reports that have no pertinence to this case, and we have to filter through literally thousands of those documents to determine uh, which ones are pertinent. Sorting through the thousands of reports took weeks. It was painstaking work, especially when the agents weren't certain what they were looking for. But all the hard work paid off when the FBI discovered two suspicious activities reports. These had been filed earlier by bank tellers who reported certain unusual cash transactions made by none other than Michelle Chambers. On the Monday after the robbery, Michelle walked into a Nations Bank branch, flashed a briefcase full of cash, and asked how much she could deposit before she had to sign any paperwork. She made a point to assure the teller it wasn't drug money. By asking about paperwork, Michelle got the very thing she didn't want. Her conversation with the teller generated a suspicious activity report. While this was helpful information and certainly cast further suspicion on the chambers, it didn't tie them to the Loomis money. The FBI began to take a much closer look at Steve and Michelle Chambers. One of the things that the surveillance led us to was both Steve and Michelle Chambers going into banks, making fairly substantial cash deposits, acquiring safe deposit boxes. Agents started round the clock surveillance. But in a small town, it was difficult to keep surveillance a secret. 
Cramerton Police Chief David Young. In a small town, any vehicle that's not normally seen in a neighborhood becomes a suspicious vehicle. I think that was probably one of the biggest problems we had, understanding what was going on and trying to explain to residents who were calling about suspicious vehicles uh, and, and trying to tell them what was going on without actually telling them what was going on. Chief Young not only had to cover the FBI's activities to Chambers' neighbors, but also to the mayor. I would come down my driveway to, to head in to town hall for the day, and I would see a car sitting there with two men in it. And first of all, the car didn't belong there. And secondly, for two men to be sitting in a car in the morning wouldn't make sense. And I would say to David, our police chief, there's a, there's a car at the base of my driveway. And he would say, you know, yes, he, he knew about that, and they had it under control. And the cars would be there, you know, in the wee hours of the morning and at night, at just very peculiar times. The FBI did not limit their surveillance to the land. They also took to the air, employing small planes to ensure they didn't lose the chambers when they were on the move. The planes drew a lot of attention. Chief Young continued to get calls. Not only are we dealing with reports of suspicious vehicles, now we've got to come up with some reason for a, uh, a plane flying low in the area. As all this surveillance raised the suspicions of the residents of Cramerton, the FBI's main okay. concern was that Steve and Michelle Chambers might learn they were the ones under suspicion. The FBI's fears were unfounded. It seems Steve and Michelle were the only people in town who hadn't noticed someone was watching them. Two months after the heist, as Christmas approached, the Chambers, oblivious to all the police activity, continued their spending spree. The FBI learned the couple bought a truck from Michelle's stepfather. Steve Chambers presented his wife with an early Christmas present a three-and-a-half-carat diamond ring purchased for $43,000 in cash. While the chamber's spending was reaching bizarre levels, the FBI still couldn't prove they were spending the stolen Loomis cash. <laughs> Nor could agents connect chambers to David Gant. As the holidays progressed, neither Gant's wife or his family heard from him. As investigators struggled to find his accomplices, David Gant's family began to fear the worst. It had been over two months since their last contact with David. The FBI kept in touch with him, but it seemed David Gant truly had disappeared. After the holidays, the chambers continued to spend, and all the FBI could do was watch. They feared if they got too close, the chambers would become suspicious. Steve Chambers made a particularly difficult target. He kept a very close circle of friends. He didn't talk outside his friends or family. He never, uh, he'd never go out drinking with anybody or uh, out to dinner or hang out with somebody he hadn't known for years. Um, so it was a matter of literally getting uh, yearbooks and uh, trying to figure out where these two could have crossed paths in the past or um, where they were going together now. One of the people the FBI found in Steve Chambers' yearbooks was David Gant's friend, Kelly Campbell. The FBI paid another visit to Kelly. Of all the people originally interviewed after the heist, only Kelly Campbell refused to take a polygraph test. They wanted her to take the test, hoping that she could help them make the link between Campbell and the Chambers. Hello? Or lead them to David Gant. 
Kelly Campbell wanted no part of Special Agent Wahamba or myself. We sat down with her and we tried to address her in such a way that a concerned friend would want to assist the FBI in trying to locate a friend of theirs, David Gant. She had no interest in assisting us in locating David Scott Gant. In fact, she cut the interview very short. She was very nervous during this interview. Her pager went off, her cell phone went off, and it just was not a typical interview. Kelly Campbell's second interview was so odd that it only served to further raise the agent's suspicion. She continued to deny she was close to David, but the agents were not convinced. All the agents had were their suspicions. What you have is, out of the thousands of calls and the thousands of leads and the thousands of names, you start having a couple of names rise to the top. You've got, again, Kelly Campbell, who her version of a relationship with David Gant does not match with anyone else's. You've got the Paynes, who've made some acquisitions that we can't account for, and also the fact that he works where a crucial piece of evidence has been found. And then you've got the Chambers, who have recently spent a vast amount of money that we can't exactly account for. And the question becomes, how are they all connected? How are they all connected to David Scott Gant? The agents had several suspects, but they had no evidence to conclusively link the money to Loomis Fargo or the suspects to one another. Their biggest problem was that after investigating the heist for three months, the only man they knew was involved in the heist still eluded them. With no idea where David Gant had gone, the FBI continued to watch the chambers. With a new home, new cars, new tanning beds, and more home furnishings than they knew what to do with, things continued to look up for Steve and Michelle Chambers going into 1998. Had the Chambers themselves thought to look up, they would have seen the FBI looking back. But they never did. Across from the Gastonia Courthouse, Steve and Michelle bought the Furniture Discount Center. Neither Steve or Michelle had held a steady job for the past two years. But they bought their way into the furniture business. They rechristened their new store, M&S Furniture Gallery, after themselves. Three months after the heist, the Chamber's out-of-control spending gave the FBI a huge break. The observed Michelle Chambers and Kelly Campbell at the furniture store together. Campbell was driving a brand new minivan. By tracing the license plate number on the van, agents identified the registered owner as a known alias of Steve Chambers. The FBI finally connected Kelly Campbell to Steve Chambers. Their investigation was beginning to take shape. As the FBI continued to watch, all over the Charlotte area, the chamber's spending continued at a dizzying pace. I'm sorry. And so did the deposits. Michelle Chambers was becoming well known at all the banks around suburban Charlotte and to the FBI. Agent John Wydra. She was the money person. She was the one making the deposits at the bank. She was the home decorator. She was trying to put this new life that they had built for themselves together and hold themselves out as legitimate business people, um, as people that could fit in uh, with individuals who had that type of money legitimately. In late January 1998, she made an $8,000 deposit that gave the FBI the evidence they had been seeking from the beginning. 
FBI agents were surveilling a bank when Michelle Chambers walked in to make a deposit. The agents watched as she handed the teller packets of cash wrapped in money bands. One of them was from Loomis. This was the first evidence that tied the Chambers' wealth directly to Loomis Fargo. Even better, the money band still bore the handwritten initials of a Loomis employee. That wrapper was taken immediately to Loomis Fargo, where we received samples of all initials, uh, people who would initial bank bands at the Loomis Fargo facility. And there were only five that were there at the time that the robbery had happened. Uh, and it turned out to be an employee who had not worked in the vault since the robbery. And that was by pure coincidence. Um, and that conclusively tied that money to Loomis Fargo prior to the robbery. Michelle's previous banking gaffe had been fruitful for the authorities. But this one finally linked the chambers with the stolen cash. The FBI felt it was still too early to make arrests. The robber, the accomplices, and the cash still had to be discovered. Agents had to decide what to do with this newfound information. Do we go ahead, make the arrest, take them down for what we had, the money laundering charges, etc., and hope that they would lead us to the remaining money in David Scott Gant, or do we hold tight? And the decision was made, let's hold on just a little longer and hope that we get that one piece of information that will lead us to David Scott Gant. The FBI would wait on the arrests in the hopes the gang would tip them off as to Gant's whereabouts. Now that they could tie the gang to the Luma's money, the FBI had enough evidence to get warrants to search all the players' houses. But the FBI couldn't be certain they would find the evidence they needed. They feared if subpoenaed before a grand jury, the suspects might lie or invoke the Fifth Amendment and then go out to cover their tracks. A judge agreed with the FBI's concerns. On February 10th, he authorized a tap on the chamber's phone. The FBI got permission to place taps anywhere they thought Steve and Michelle might be talking. They began to listen in on all the chamber's business transactions at their furniture store. With the wiretaps in place, the FBI settled in to begin monitoring the gang's phone conversations. Okay, take it easy. We've got a lot left. The FBI heard anything and everything. What does he want? The gang was speaking of business and their plans to spend money. But they weren't speaking about the heist. Yeah, Mike McKinney Chambers made here. phone calls about setting up a $2.5 million bank account in the yeah, Cayman yeah, Islands. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm thinking about he discussed hiring a man named Mike McKinney as a bodyguard for $400 a week plus an apartment. Yeah, yeah, that's him. Yeah. Campbell talked about putting on some weight and wanting liposuction. For the FBI, most of the talk was useless. We were getting at the critical stage in the wiretap where you can only do that for so long, showing you're trying to gather a certain amount of evidence and then you have to break it off and we were just about at that point to make the decision to let's round up who we know and what we know about them and hope that they'll lead us to David Scott Gant. It's at that point that we get the break where Kelly Campbell tells Steve Chambers guess who I just heard from. The FBI heard Kelly Campbell tell Steve Chambers that she had received a page from David Gant. This was the first evidence the FBI had Gant was still alive and was working with Campbell in the chambers. What'd you tell him? The FBI wanted to capture his voice on tape. <laughs> Kelly and David set up a system where David would send a coded numeric page to Kelly telling her where and when he would call her. 
Campbell told Chambers when the two were supposed to speak next. At the time when David Gant arranged to speak with Kelly Campbell, the FBI was in place, ready and waiting. But Kelly wasn't. Surveillance leads us to a payphone where Kelly is supposed to be receiving an incoming call from David Gant. We're all standing by. We've gotten the legal authority to intercept that phone call, and Kelly Campbell simply does not show. After months of watching and waiting, it seemed the FBI's most pressing question would go unanswered. After months of monitoring Kelly Campbell and Steve Chambers, the FBI was waiting to hear David Gant's voice and confirm that he was still alive. As agents waited to listen in on a prearranged phone call between Gant and Campbell, a serious complication arose. It's when it rang and she was nowhere to be found, and we went ahead and picked up the phone just to see who was on the other end. And we were able to capture that voice on the other end and we knew we had David Scott Gant at the other end of that phone. The FBI finally had a voice on tape and confirmed it was David Gantz. They now knew he was alive, but didn't know where he was. He hung up before the call could be traced. Hearing his voice gave the agents enough information to extend their phone taps. They would simply have to wait and see if the gang would lead them to David Gant. The next time David Gant paged Kelly Campbell, she immediately called Steve Chambers. I've heard from him again. The FBI was listening to their conversation. Kelly told what? Steve she was afraid Gant would ask for more money. The agents were surprised to learn that Gant had apparently run out of cash and desperately needed Kelly to send him some. The agents listening in couldn't imagine how a man who stole $17 million could have run out of cash, unless the money was still in the Charlotte area. Steve Chambers told Kelly they couldn't wait any longer. It was time to get rid of Gant once and for all. He told her to stop by the furniture store so they could discuss how to proceed. When Kelly arrived at the store, the FBI had an agent inside. Steve told Kelly that Gant's requests for money had to stop. He told her it was time to put their plan to kill Gant into action. We can tell him we're going to send him some more money. Gant was like the that. only one who could tie them to the money. If he was gone, they would be free and clear. I'm done. He calls no problem now. Chambers said Mike McKinney had been in place for months, ready to take care of Gant. But they had one problem. Although Kelly was talking to David on the phone, no one knew where he was. Chambers pressured Kelly when Gant called again to find out where he was staying. I gotta have some more money. When David called Kelly, she knew what she had to do. Okay, David, David told Kelly he loved her and he couldn't wait for her to join him. He told her he was in Cozumel, Mexico. The FBI finally had the information they sought. David Gant had been hiding south of the border since the heist. Now, like the FBI, Kelly also knew where he was. She told him someone would deliver more money and he should stay where he was and wait for it. I'm not so sure. With that, she appeared to seal David Gant's fate. From the time the FBI overheard Steve Chambers talking about hiring Mike McKinney, the FBI had been keeping a close eye on him. Get him out, 
They got a break when they heard Chambers ask McKinney to meet him in a hotel room outside Charlotte. When the two men met, the FBI was waiting. They heard Chambers arrange for McKinney to take a few guys with him down to Mexico to finish off David Gant. The FBI had to move fast. In a few days, someone would be coming to kill Gant. He's still our, our prime suspect. He's the one who's removed the money, and we want him back. Now, we're armed with the information that there is a plot to take his life. And with that information, it's our job, first and foremost, to protect him and uh, intercept those folks before they can have him killed. On Sunday morning, March 1st, 1998, five months after the Loomis Fargo heist, three agents checked into a Mexican hotel. They had come to get David Gant. Five months after the Loomis Fargo heist, the FBI finally identified the key players, and they had located David Gant. They were now in a deadly race against Gant's accomplices to find him before they did. Just days after Steve Chambers ordered Gant's murder, three men approached him. One asked to see his identification. Please tell me you're an FBI agent. David Gant knew it was over. And he says to me, please tell me you're an FBI agent. And I said, I am. And the next thing he said to me was, we really need to talk. And I said, yes, we do. And then he told me, I'm really glad to see you. And I told him that I was glad to see him also. And that was it. He was quietly arrested. Twenty-four hours after the arrest, on the day David Gant's accomplices planned to have him killed, he was on a flight back to Charlotte, North Carolina. Now that Gant was in custody, the FBI was able to piece together how the gang pulled off the heist. David Gant worked at Loomis Fargo for several years. It was here where he first met Kelly Campbell. The two hit it off. Gant was from the same working class stock as Campbell. But working around all that money was not a job David Gant enjoyed. Actually, money smells, it stinks. It's got the ink smell. Um, and when you spend 12, 14 hours a day with it, and you're in every bank in Charlotte, huh? it's a boring job. David's wife, Tammy, kept him on a strict budget. Each week, they barely had enough money for food, let alone life's little luxuries. Meanwhile, Kelly and David met occasionally outside work. In one of these meetings, Kelly had a question for David. She asked him what he would think if they robbed Loomis. She told him he would be the perfect person to pull off the heist. And if he did, he could finally live the way he always wanted. She told him she had a friend who could help hide the money and help Gant get away. The three of them could split the money three ways. As an ex-employee, Kelly guessed they could take about $4 million apiece. She hinted with all that money, she and David could live together any way they wanted. I was kind of shocked. I thought she was just playing with me. Um, and then the, I started thinking about it kind of serious. And then one day in September, 
Gant became very serious when he realized it would take 30 years of monthly payments to zero out his credit card. Gant called Kelly Campbell with his decision. Yeah, I've been thinking about it. Yeah, I'll do it. Me and my wife had run up some bills, and we were kind of tight financially. And uh, the idea just appealed to me. Over the next few weeks, Gant finally began paying close attention to how Loomis operated. He started to pick apart their security system and target the weakest links, mainly their lack of manpower. Their physical security was actually real good. It was just they didn't have enough people to cover all the spots. And that left me with all the keys by myself, which, you know, $17 million, who wouldn't go, really? It seemed again that if he chose a weekend when he was closing the vault himself, he could probably walk away with nearly $17 million. Taking the money would be easy. Getting away would be difficult. He began to study, and he discussed everything with Kelly. He read up on the FBI and learned that most investigations center around the area of the crime and then spread outwards. They come at every crime pretty much the same way. And especially robberies, they look at the airports and the train stations and the bus stations, and they make a little bubble around the crime. And if they don't really find you right there, they're, they're at zero. So that buys you some time. So my plan was for, for us to just get out of that bubble. Gant realized that after the heist, he would have to get as far away from Charlotte as he could. Sure. That meant he would need a fake passport and a way out of the Let's country. While Gant was doing his homework, Steve Chambers became the real mastermind behind the plan. Gant never met or spoke to Chambers. He didn't even know his name. That way, they couldn't implicate each other should they get caught. Chambers relayed information to Gant through Kelly Campbell. He made all the arrangements for after the robbery, including assembling the gang. He recruited his cousin, Scott Grant, and high school pal Eric Payne for $100,000 apiece to help hide the money. Chambers also took care of getting Gant out of the country. He paid a man $50,000 for his birth certificate to create a false ID for Gant. With the simple plan in place, David Gant learned on Saturday, October 4th, 1997, he was scheduled to close the Loomis facility by himself. This was the day. Early that morning, David Gant kissed his sleeping wife goodbye, took a last look at his mobile home, and left for work knowing that he wouldn't be returning tonight or anytime soon. 7 ties with, with your family and your wife. Um, that's probably the hardest thing to do, but I don't know how to explain it. You realize that, well, maybe in four or five years I can contact them, but you know you're only lying to yourself about that. You know you can't come back. David Gant went about his business at Loomis as he had every other day he had worked there. Later that afternoon, the gang assembled to wait for David Gant. Campbell used David Gant's cell phone to call him at Loomis and set up a meeting time. The plan required Gant be alone at Loomis after the last truck came in. 
He was going to load the cash into a company van and then drive out of Loomis around 5 o'clock p.m. When Gant responded to Kelly's page, he told her two obstacles stood in their way. One, he couldn't be ready with the cash until 6.30 or 7 that evening after the last truck returned. Two, Gant found out he would be breaking in a new trainee today. The gang would have to spend a few anxious hours waiting for David to try and get the warehouse to himself. After the last truck rolled in nearly 30 minutes later than expected, Gant and the new trainee were the only two people in the Loomis warehouse. Gant played on the trainee's inexperience. I just went through the motions of closing down the vault. He thought I locked the vault. And he was tired. And when I told him to go, he got right in his car and left. All right, David, I'm out of here, man. After the trainee drove off, David Gant had to face his own moment of truth. I'm not sure if I've got the guts to do it. Because I know as soon as I put that first dollar in that van, I can't go back. If I steal one dollar, I've got to steal them all. David Gant decided to steal them all. He took a moment to pause and gaze at his future, lying before him in deceptively neat green stacks. Then he got to work. Steve Chambers' friend, Eric Payne, drove a rented van to the parking lot at Reynolds & Reynolds, the printing company where he worked. The plant was closed for the night, and the lot wasn't visible from the street. He would wait for Gant and the others to arrive with the cash. Steve Chambers, Scott Grant, and Kelly Campbell parked across the street from the one-story brick Loomis warehouse, where they would wait until Gant appeared in a cash-heavy Loomis van. Back inside, Gant lifted pallets of shrink-wrapped cash packeted in Loomis wrappers to a white company van 15 feet away. His every move was caught on tape. Outside Loomis, across the street, Chambers was getting nervous because Gant was already running late. Kelly kept calling Gant every few minutes and paging him with the 143 code. It meant I love you, each number representing the number of letters in each word. It was not a sophisticated code, as the FBI had suspected. Inside, David was beginning to feel the pressure. And Kelly's repeated pages only served to make him message. nervous. I gotta go. At about 7.45, nearly an hour later than originally planned, Gant couldn't fit another brick of money inside the vehicle. He had packed Ford's biggest van with literally a ton of cash. Gant removed the tapes from two video recorders locked in a cabinet in the security room. He didn't know about the third recorder. After months of planning and several nervous hours emptying the vault, David Gant was ready to make his drive to freedom.
but he couldn't get out of the gate. Gant didn't know who this good Samaritan was. He was afraid he had been caught until he looked across the street, saw Campbell's truck, okay, okay. All right. and realized this must be an accomplice. Go, 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 go. David had thought only he, Kelly, and her unnamed friend were in on the plan. This was an unpleasant surprise, but he would have to worry about that later. After many frustrating delays, David Gant was finally, if momentarily, a rich man. Driving a ton of money in that particular van, it was a great feeling. I mean, the ride wasn't very good, but it was a great feeling. Um, it's probably one of the best drives I've ever taken in my life. I'm driving along, thinking, I've done it. I'm going to be famous. You know, these people are going to freak out tomorrow. But in just a few minutes, his euphoria ended. I'm sitting at a light, and I look across and I see this uh, Charlotte Mech police. Oh God, they already know. So I decided to smoke me a cigarette, calm myself down. I'm shaking too bad to light a cigarette sitting there thinking, Dave, you gotta be calm. After months of planning, David Gant's simple plan seemed as if it would come to a simple end. Loomis Fargo vault supervisor David Gant had just driven out of his company's warehouse in a van stuffed with millions of dollars. It seemed just as he was about to begin his life as a millionaire, Fortune was not on his side. Then his luck changed, and he went on his way. The police didn't follow. It seemed they hadn't heard of the heist. Gant was in the clear. He then pulled into the Reynolds and Reynolds parking lot with the gang following right behind. As he got out of the van, yet another stranger approached. I'm with you, all right? Come on, give me the key. Eric Payne assured him it was okay. He was with the gang. All right. All right. Gant handed off the key to the Loomis van. Gant and Campbell drove off. But what they left behind was a major problem. The key to the van was on an eight-inch ring with about 200 others. In all the excitement, someone lost track of exactly which key opened the Loomis van. Did he hand you the key or not? Settling in for the ride to Columbia Airport in South Carolina, and unaware of the chaos they left behind. David and Kelly were excited. They actually pulled it off. Of the millions David had taken from Loomis Fargo, he only took $30,000 to start his new life. But for all his meticulous planning, he didn't give any thought to how he would carry it aboard the plane. Kelly had a quick solution. They pulled into a convenience store and she bought a pair of pantyhose, which she cut up and stuffed with money. It was quick thinking on her part. But thinking wasn't quite as quick back at the van. After unsuccessful efforts to find the right key, the trio moved on to more desperate methods of trying to open the van. Apparently, it didn't occur to them that armored vans have bulletproof glass. 
While Chambers and company struggled to get the money, David Gant was wearing his. Back at the van, the gang held the key to their future in their hands. But they still didn't know which one. Then they caught a break. Chambers and his accomplices froze in awe at the sight of so much money, though they didn't yet know how much they had. Chambers brought three blue barrels to carry the cash. But with the barrels filled to the brim, the trio had to leave behind the packets of one and five dollar bills. They headed off to ditch the van and hide the money. At the Columbia Airport, Kelly and David encountered their own problem. Because his plan didn't include making plane reservations, Gant and Campbell learned only upon arriving at Columbia Airport that there were no flights to Mexico. I don't know what she did. It's all right, it's Kelly. Kelly phoned Steve Chambers, who told her to send Gant to Atlanta, about 200 miles away. OK. As the bus pulled out of the Columbia bus station, David began his life as a fugitive with the hope that Kelly would soon join him in Mexico. But David's trip to Mexico wouldn't be without incident. On a layover in New Orleans, a woman approached him as if she recognized him. I think I know you. I don't think so. You're that German tennis player, Boris Becker. I'm Mike from Atlanta. I'm in computer cells. I kind of have a mild panic attack. I'm not sure if the news has come out yet, because I'm not sure what time it is. I said, no, ma'am, I'm not Boris Becker. From the moment Gant arrived in Cancun, Mexico, he started living it up. Dining in all the best restaurants, alone. Gant, a stranger in a tropical paradise, found his reception chilly. Throughout the carefree months of October 1997, Gant's wallet was getting thinner. He continued to spend, but because he couldn't carry his share of the loot with him to Mexico, he had to rely on his accomplices to send him the cash he needed. By the end of October, only a few weeks after the heist, Gant's resources were already drying up. I called Campbell, I said, hey, I'm running low on money, I need you to send me some. And I asked for like $50,000. Oh, that's not. Not too bad of a request. I mean, they've got plenty of money. Why shouldn't they send me some? To deliver Gant's money, Steve Chambers sent Mike McKinney, who traveled under the name Bruno. McKinney's orders were to give Gant the cash and keep an eye on him until the gang could find the perfect time to kill him. Bruno finally shows up one morning. I'd been out partying. And uh, I opened the door and asked me, uh, you looking for some help from Charlotte? And I go, yeah, invited me in. Bruno gave Gant a small packet of money. When Gant protested, he told him that's all they gave him. And it's like $8,000, it's hardly anything. And um, I called Campbell up, where's my money? I'm, I'm suspicious of something now, because I've asked for one thing and got another. 
adios, amigo. Yeah. For the first time, it occurred to David Gant that he might never see the millions of dollars he thought would be his. But David Gant soon encountered a larger problem. He was eating dinner at a restaurant in Cancun when a stranger approached. And uh, he says, you know who you look like? I'm thinking, Boris Becker. He goes, you look like that guy that stole like $20 million from North Carolina. I'm like, really? I'm, and I give him a little spiel about how I've living, been living in Mexico for years. You know, it couldn't be me. And inside, I'm, I'm panicking. Gant was shaken. If people were recognizing him, the story of the heist must not be dying down. He knew he would have to make some changes. Gant laid low, continuing to keep to himself. He spent his time reading comics and listening to Eagle CDs. While he was keeping his low profile, Gant got some unexpected help. Hey, my name's Robert. Yeah. A stranger knocked on his door. The man identified himself as Robert and told Gant he was a friend of Bruno's. What's the when Gant let him in, he had a question for David. He thinks I'm some kind of drug dealer. And I, no, man, I ain't got nothing to do with that stuff. He says, well, these people want to kill you. Well, what's the deal with that? Instantly, I knew that I was never going to see my money and that these people were trying to kill me. And now uh, I'd have to change the way I lived. Robert told Gant Bruno was working for the people in Charlotte and they were putting together a plan to have him killed. They were just waiting for the perfect opportunity. Look, um, he came to warn him. Uh, I got $2,000 here. Gant gave Robert $2,000 to keep quiet and vowed to himself he wouldn't give them the perfect opportunity. If he ever met Bruno again, it would not be the two of them alone. David's grand plan hadn't worked out as he had expected. He was now wanted by the FBI for stealing money that he would likely never see and targeted for death by his accomplices. He started staying inside most of the day and coming out only at night. Afraid for his safety since that life-saving tip from the mysterious Robert, Gant started changing hotels and using aliases. It was at this time the gang lost touch with him. Stealing all the money, being on the lam, having somebody trying to kill you, um, it makes you find out what kind of person you are. You know, do you really have guts? Um, can you really think on your feet? Look, I gotta have some more money. While thinking on his feet, Gant made one mistake. He didn't believe yeah, Kelly was part right of the away. plot to have him killed. And when he called her again to ask for money, he told her where he was staying. I'm in Cozumel. The gang and the FBI both learned where Gant was. Shortly after that, he ran into the FBI. He walked out of his hotel one morning and was picked up by Agent Rossi. Now that the FBI had Gant in custody, they needed the rest of the gang. But Agent Rossi had a question. I just wasn't sure what it was about Kelly that was this force that would allow him to commit a crime of this magnitude. So the question for David Gant was, what is it about Kelly? Obviously, there's something there. 
And David's answer to me was, if you can believe this, I only kissed her once. And then he turned and looked at me and said, turns out to be a pretty expensive kiss, kiss, doesn't it? And obviously it was an expensive kiss. When the plane landed in Charlotte, the FBI knew they had to move quickly to arrest the rest of the gang before they learned Gant was captured. On Monday, March 2nd, 1998, five months after the Loomis Fargo heist, a task force of FBI agents and local police quietly approached the Chambers home in the early morning hours. When Steve Chambers came to the door, he was told that someone had broken into his furniture store. Get on the ground. 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 His days as a rich man were over. Upstairs, agents arrested Michelle Chambers. On the night of the robbery, Steve Chambers had sworn his cohorts to secrecy should they ever get caught. On the day of the arrest, Steve Chambers named them all to the FBI. As the Chambers were being arrested in their mansion, Kelly Campbell was also visited by the FBI. The agents searched her home. They confiscated anything that might have looked suspicious. They took credit cards, appliances, jewelry, and boxes of cash. Gang member Mike McKinney was arrested in his Gastonia, North Carolina hotel room. Stand him up. All right, get him up, get him up. All right, you have the right to remain silent. Anything For his part, helping to unload the money, Eric Payne met the same fate. Agents seized everything stolen money could buy and anything that might have been used in a crime. Same thing, same thing. All the items that triggered his co-workers' suspicions about his wild spending were confiscated, including his Chevy Tahoe. The FBI recovered well over a million dollars in cash from the gang's private homes. Of course, the most cash, the most jewelry, the most everything came from the Chamber's palace. $720,000 in cash and 460 different items. All of it carried out of the house by federal agents. The neighbors, including Cramerton Mayor Kathy Biles, now understood the suspicious looking cars and strangers around the neighborhood over the past months. I was shocked when I found out it was one of those very surreal moments where you start piecing everything together that had happened since the Loomis Fargo story had first come out. And then you start thinking about all the times you've seen the chambers and um, what they were like and how the money had um, revealed itself in their lives. As neighbors looked on, they could see the FBI using money counting machines for two full days inside the house. Agents found cash in desk drawers, a shoebox in Michelle's closet, a blue barrel from the night of the robbery in the basement. The Chambers had once borrowed a shovel from a neighbor, leading the FBI to believe that maybe there was money buried in the backyard. Ironically, none of the six accused had enough money to hire their own attorney. They were appointed counsel by the court and held without bond until their hearing. In the 
the courthouse, as Kelly Campbell and David Gant were waiting for their hearing, they had a moment to talk. Thinking back on all that had happened, Kelly began to regret betraying her friend. She apologized to David, but it was too late. David Gant at that time believed he was in love. Kelly Campbell at that time wanted, wanted the money. And uh, that was pretty consistent throughout the investigation. Um, David Gant believed he was going to live with her uh, for the rest of his days on a beach somewhere with his third of the money and her third of the money. Uh, Kelly Campbell, I don't believe, ever had any intentions of leaving this country. A total of nearly $10 million was recovered from 24 different safe deposit boxes that Chambers paid his friends and relatives to set up on his behalf. In all, there were 21 defendants. 20 pleaded guilty. Only one pled not guilty. Chambers attorney Jeffrey Guller, who was convicted by a jury for money laundering. United States Attorney for the Western District of North Carolina, Mark Calloway, gives credit where it is due. In the end, we indicted 21 people. 20 of those people pled guilty. The one that went to trial was convicted. And I think that stands to show that the FBI did a terrific job investigating the case. Eric Payne, who helped hide the money, was sentenced to six and a half years. For ditching the van, Scott Grant was sentenced to four years and seven months. Michelle Chambers received seven years, eight months. Her husband, Steve, received 11 years, three months. For the planned hit on David Gant, Mike McKinney received 11 years, six months for charges including conspiracy to commit murder. Because she cooperated with authorities, Kelly Campbell received five years and 10 months, the lightest sentence of all the principal defendants. She is currently serving time in the federal prison camp in Alderson, West Virginia. Well, I thought with all the money that life would just be so much simpler that all my problems would go away and I wouldn't have to worry about anything. But in reality, it just more or less caused more problems because of the way that it was uh, obtained. David Gant received seven years, six months in prison. He is now serving his time in the Federal Correctional Institution in Butner, North Carolina. To my family, you know, I, I cause them a lot of grief. There are still, you know, kind of touchy moments with me and my family. Um, and it was too much for my wife. She divorced me about, uh, about a month ago now. This heist cost David Gant everything. Yet he remains undaunted. Well, now that I've been sentenced, would I do it again? Yeah. Um, opportunity like that comes around once in a lifetime. And now that I'm already in prison and been judged and everything, I can be more honest and say, sure. The gang members were ordered to pay millions of dollars in restitution. This is money they will likely be paying for the rest of their lives. For the FBI, it was a relief to know they had captured the Loomis gang. This was not an easy case to wrap up in a nice, neat bundle at all. And there was a pressure that we put on ourselves a lot. We wanted it all. We wanted David Gant back, safe and sound. We wanted all the people responsible, all the people that participated, and we wanted the money. In the end, the FBI got it all. To Agent John Wydra, it seemed the gang hadn't fully thought their crime through. I don't think they were thinking um, that they could get away with it. They were looking at uh, the end result they were looking at, you know, being millionaires on a beach, the way everybody daydreams. Um, and they weren't thinking of the consequences at all. The gang lost everything. 
every item they bought with the Loomis cash was confiscated by the FBI. In February of 1999, over 5,000 people turned out for an auction of over 1,000 items bought with money from the heist. Michelle's convertible BMW and a velvet Elvis were among the souvenirs that went to the highest bidders. The proceeds of about $360,000 went to Lloyd's of London, Loomis Fargo's insurance company. 